So as I mentioned last week, we're going to be uh, starting, uh, well, last week we, we kind of started it, gave you a thorough introduction into the book of Hebrews. So if you didn't get a chance to watch that, uh, definitely, you know, check that out. It was from last week's message, and it may be helpful for you, um, maybe some of the questions that you may have as we go through this book now, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Because that's what we do here, and we love doing that. And we, I love teaching and sharing with you and preaching the Word of God that way. Um, I think it's, you know, one of the best ways to learn. So, um, as I said, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 1 this morning. And we're only going to be covering the first three verses because they're so significant. They're so important. Um, and I'm going to be showing you how Jesus is better than the Old Testament prophets. All right, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us, to speak to us this morning. Um, and uh, let's open our hearts and minds. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you've brought us here on this beautiful January morning. Uh, ask that you bless this time, Lord. Uh, we pray that our, all our problems, issues going on outside these walls may, may fade away. And right now, just, may we just dedicate this time to you, Lord. As we continue in this time of, of just drawing near to you and, and, and worship now, Lord. As we worship you now, as we hear the word, read the word, and, and just chew on it as well, Lord pray you will change lives here, Lord, that you will um, transform hearts, and you will do the same for those that are watching and listening to this message, Lord, wherever they may be, wherever that may be, whenever that may be. Lord, we know that you're a, a big and awesome God, and nothing is beyond your knowledge, nothing is beyond your grasp, Lord, and that you've ordained all things according to your good plan and purpose. We pray again that you bless this time. I was about to read your word and may you speak to us powerfully. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter one. And again, the title of my message is Jesus is better than the Old Testament prophets. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And there the word of God says, Long ago God spoke to the fathers by the, by the, by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days he has spoken to us by his son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, glory and exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So here again, the writer of Hebrews this is a letter, so this isn't like a typical letter. It doesn't begin with a typical introduction like you wouldn't see in Paul's letters. Here, the introduction is simply, a, it's about Jesus. Now, on the premise that a superior messenger brings a weightier message, in these three verses, the writer indirectly shows Jesus preeminence over the Old Testament prophets. This comparison points to the superiority of his revelation to theirs. Long ago, God disclosed truth to the Jewish fathers. Let me give you some examples of how that was so. He spoke to Moses by a burning bush. He spoke to Elijah by a steel small voice. He spoke to Isaiah by a heavenly vision. He spoke to Hosea 
by his family crisis. He spoke to Amos by a basket of fruit. Well, if you've read those stories, you're familiar with those stories, you know that when he did that, he did it at different times and conveyed it in a variety of different ways. Now, more recently, God has again spoken. However, this time, it wasn't delivered through mere human seers, but by divine spokesman, his son. Now, Paul makes it clear in Romans chapter 1 that not only, not, not only creation all around, but also conscience, the conscience within every man, every woman, verifies the existence of God. Throughout Scripture, angels have attested to the reality of God. Prophets have spoken clearly and unmistakably, unmistakably of God's truthfulness, of God's existence, of God's word. Yet, in none of these ways, creation above, conscious within, angels from on high, prophets in our midst, was a message complete. It wasn't comprehensible. It was difficult to grasp. So God sent his son, his final word to humanity. There's nothing more to be said. There's nothing left unsaid. It's all said in Christ. Well, then you might be wondering or asking, why didn't God just send his son in the first place? Why did he bother with the lengthy, prof the lengthy process of sending the prophets, of speaking, uh, and also of speaking through creation? Why didn't he just send Jesus immediately? I'll suggest that our pride is the answer. Now, Father, you didn't have to send your son, we would have said. We could have figured you out by looking at the stars. Or if you would have just blessed a prophet, we would have gotten your message from him. Or surely an angel would have, would have been sufficient. It's almost as though the Father has to constantly let us play out all our options in our heads before we realize our own stupidity, before we say, you know what, we're sinners. We're not capable of figuring things out. Father, we need Jesus. You see, had we gone through this entire process in human history, I believe we would be arguing perpetually. Oh, Father, you didn't have to become a man and dwell among us. And certainly you didn't have to die for us. You could have just given us 10 rules and we would have lived by them. That's the tendency of humanity, to feel like we can do it. So God has to allow history to unfold in such a way that we see that we're losers, failures, blockheads, idiots until we finally say we're stuck. We need your son to dwell among us. We need a savior to die for us. We need Jesus. Now, verse three, I'm gonna share some things in verse three that are pretty amazing. Okay, it actually begins at the end of verse, um, the end of verse two. And there it says, God has appointed him heir of, all heir of all things. There we see that Jesus is the inheritor. The Father has willed everything to the Son. And we are his inheritance, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. This explains the parable Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13 about a man who walked through a field, found a treasure, and bought the field in order to take out the, take out the treasure. What is that parable about? Isn't, isn't, uh, it isn't about us selling everything to buy the treasure of the gospel. No. For in an earlier parable, in the same chapter, Jesus says, The field is the world. 
Jesus bought the world with his own blood. Why? He wanted the treasure that was in the world. And what was that treasure? We are. We are his inheritance. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that beautiful? And again, he says later on in that same verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, and made the universe through him. Jesus, my friends, is the creator. People get confused. They say Genesis chapter 1 says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But John chapter 1 says that without the Son, nothing was made that was made. So who created the earth? The Father or the Son? I suggest you think of creation this way. The Father as the architect, the Son as the contractor, and the Holy Spirit as the carpenter. The analogy is far from perfect. I know it's it's not, it will, no one will ever be able to explain the Trinity. It's just too mind-boggling. Even for the most knowledgeable theologian, Bible scholar, to break it down. But the fact is that all three persons of the Godhead were involved in the creation process. Creation occurred from the Father, by the Son, through the Holy Spirit. Well, in the beginning of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory. You see, there, in that verse there, we learn that Jesus is the radiator. A reflector is some, something that bounces light off itself. For example, the moon is a reflector of the glory of the sun. When you see the moon, you're not seeing its own light. You're seeing the reflection of the sun. Not so with Jesus. He not only reflects the glory of the Father, but he radiates the glory of the Father. He's all the light we need. That's why uh, there is neither sun nor moon in heaven. Jesus is the radiator. Jesus is is the representer. And then, again, verse 3 goes on to say that he is the, the exact expression of his nature. Jesus is the representer. The literal translation of the term express image refers to the method used to imprint coins in biblical times where a piece of metal would be pounded against a sharp, a stamp of the head of Caesar, making an express image. Although the stamp and the coin were two different entities, both were the same image. Show us the Father and it will suffice us, said, Pil said Philip. Don't you understand that he who has seen me has seen the Father, answered Jesus. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am the exact expression of God the Father. And then again, verse, back in verse 3, well, he's sustaining all things by his powerful word. There, Jesus is a sustainer. Now, what holds the atom? The very building block of all matter. What is it? What holds it all together? Nothing other than Jesus Christ and his word. What's going to hold your marriages together? What's going to hold your life together? Your parenting, your sanity What's going to keep your world from falling apart? Only one thing. The word of his power. 
Jesus is also the purifier. Verse 3 again. After making purification for sins. The phrase, it means two things. It means through himself, that is, with his own body. Jesus purged my sins. He purged your sins. But also means that he alone purged everyone's sins. The Hebrew Christians to whom this book is addressed would know that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest alone made sacrifice for the sins of the entire nation. The Levitical high priest expended great energy, yet that was nothing compared to the energy expended by our high priest, Jesus Christ. He gave his entire life in order to purify me, in order to purify you from our sins. So again, I'm moving on. Jesus is our ruler. It says there in verse, again, verse 3, he sat down at the right hand of God. What does he do on the right hand of the majesty on high? Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, he prays for you and me. Thus, his rule over us is based on his intercession on behalf of us. He's up there right now in full bodily form, in his full resurrection form, interceding for you and for me. He's speaking good things about you to God the Father. Even when you mess up, Jesus, I believe this. He's telling me, yeah, that's my son, that's my daughter. They've been covered by my blood. So he's interceding again for you and for me. Meditate on any of the seven traits of the incomparable Christ and your view of him will be changed. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Chronicles of Narnia, when Lucy finally sees Aslan, the lion, a picture of the Lord, the lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, she cries, Aslan, Aslan, you've grown so much bigger. Uh, No, Lucy, you've grown so much bigger. And the bigger you grow, the bigger I'll seem to you, replied Aslan. The older we get, the smaller our heroes. doesn't matter if they're sports figures, Santa Claus, or Disney characters. No matter how big we once saw them as, as children, they seem to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller as we grow up but not so with the Lord. The longer I walk with him, and maybe you've realized this too, the more I think on him, the more I learn of him. Unlike anything else in the world, he just gets bigger in my eyes. Now, I also want to mention that In these three verses, the writer also points out Jesus' superiority over the Jewish prophets in seven ways. Number one, he, not they, was divinely appointed heir heir of all things. Number two, it was through the Son that God made the world, whereas the Old Testament seers were but part of that creation. Number three, Jesus radiates the divine glory and possesses the exact same nature as God does. Moreover, number four, the Son upholds and preserves the material universe. And five, He has made purification of humanity's sins, including that of the prophets, all their transgressions, all their sins, He purified their sins. That's why he's, again, he's greater than them. And then number six, he did what no prophet could or would ever dare to do. He sat down at the right hand of God in heaven. And finally, number seven, the son is greater than the angel, just as his name is more excellent than theirs. And we'll be covering that 
next week. But none of these statements could ever be, they could never, ever be attributed to any of the prophets. The son is greater than any of them. And his message is weightier than theirs. So through this brief but tightly packed introduction, the preacher eloquently proclaims in two movements, a rich and beautiful symphony of ideas in this letter. The first, again in verses 1 and 2, he declares to his first hearers that God, a communicator of expansive foundational relation, uh, revelations through the Older Testament, has offered his ultimate revelation in one related to him. As son. Then, in the second movement, the introduction climaxes in the son's sacrificial work and the resultant exaltation to the right hand of God. So, using graphic imagery, the purification for sins and exaltation are related dynamically to the close relationship of the son to the father attributing to Christ a nature, which again is a radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. He attributed to Christ works, the creation of sustaining the universe, and he attributed to Christ a status, the inheritance of a name that points to his deity and the uniqueness of his relationship with the Father. With this well-spoken word, the author begins his sermon and lays out a powerful theological foundation for the rest of the sermon. What I want to just now tell you is that this now brings up two central truths. It brings it up to the surface. Number one, the introduction to Hebrews boldly and artistically states that God is a communicator who has spoken to the church. This communication has progressed beyond, but has, has continuity with the older covenant relation, relation in that God is still the one speaking and the Old Testament bears witness to that new era. Number two, God has communicated ultimately in the person of his son. The Son is proclaimed as one with, but distinct from, God the Father. Let me repeat that. The Son is proclaimed as one with, but distinct from, God the Father. Having a nature, activity, and position that identify Him with God. The person and work of the Son is brought to climax and focus in his exaltation to God's right hand. A position of ultimate authority and honor in the entire universe. Now, I want to share with you three applications that are found here. And what I mean by that is three things you can take with you and learn from, and maybe apply in your life, found in these three verses. First, we should interpret the Bible Christologically. Meaning we must understand the Old Testament to be looking forward to the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The New Testament shows us how he is the complete and final revelation of God to us. He is God's final and sufficient sacrifice for our sins. As Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 says, the Old Testament law is our tutor to bring us to Christ. Many Old Testament prophecies point ahead to him. All, all of this implies that if you don't read and study the Old Testament, you're going to miss much of what God wants to say to each and every one of you or tell you personally. And second, we shouldn't look 
for or to expect any new revelation from God after the completion of the New Testament. Anyone who claims to have further revelation is a false prophet. This includes anyone from, I will say it, Muhammad and the Quran to Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon to Mary Baker Eddy and her teachings. God has spoken definitively and finally in the Old and New Testaments, which point to Jesus Christ and his son. And so what I mean by that is if someone comes to you and says, hey, I've got this new revelation from God, and it's not, again, it's, if it's not in Scripture, if it's not already stated in God's word, this is, this is our complete, um, this is God's word. So this is his complete word to us. This is everything that we need to know while we're alive, while we're here. I'm sure he's going to speak to us when we, re, when we get to our new home, our you know, uh, kingdom of heaven. But for us now, this is his word, his final word to us, the words of Christ, the words of the Old Testament, the New Testament. So if someone comes and says, hey, I have this new message from God, and it doesn't line up with what it says here, yeah, they're a false prophet. Stay away from them. Stay far away from them. They're only going to do harm, and you're going to hurt a lot of people along the way. There's a lot of Christian cults that have begun that way. Some that have maybe begun innocently and then have progressed all the way to mass suicide. Again, all because either they're misinterpreting what the Bible says, what the Word of God says, or because they are claiming they've received a new revelation. Think of all the people that all these religions, again, all these false religions have led astray. How many people right now are suffering because they followed that teaching? I'm sure that whoever the leader of that, teach, the leader of that teaching was is going to receive harsher, uh, a harsher judgment, especially, especially if they had a personal relationship at one time with Jesus, if they knew the truth, they knew this is God's word, and they purposely were going out misleading others. Yeah. All throughout history, we've had people like that. So just be aware. Be aware if someone comes on TV and says, I've got a new word from the Lord. Be careful about what they have to say. And if it doesn't line up with Scripture, just turn it off. Turn off that TV and turn off that radio because, again, they're, they're false prophets. What we have here is the finality of God's word. Finally, if we're not using the Bible to come to know Jesus in a deeper, more personal way, more personal way we're not using it correctly. That's not to say that we shouldn't study theology Bible history, prophecy, and many other biblically related subjects. But it's to say that our study in all these things should lead us to know Christ better and to submit more completely to Him. It's okay if you want to go to Bible college, if you want to go to seminary, if you want to, you know, build a a collection on your theological books or, you know, Bible studies and, you know, there's all kinds of encyclopedias. I mean, I've seen books and books of commentaries. That's fine. But if your study, your reading isn't drawing, you're just studying just to get head knowledge, but you're not studying to know him more, know God more, know Jesus more personally, it's all for nothing. That head knowledge isn't going to get you anywhere. It'll make you smarter here, but if you don't, if it's not drawing you near, then what are you doing it for? You know, I want to draw near to God. I'm sure many, all of you want to draw near to God. I don't know any 
Christian who truly loves the Lord, who doesn't want to draw near to Him, want to fall more in love with Him. Because the more you do, the more it just humbles you. You just want to drop down on your knees and worship Him, glorify Him. Because, you again, you realize that how big He is and how small you are in comparison to Him. And yet, He loves you. He thinks about you. He sent His Son to die for you. You're precious to Him now. But again, it should want, it should draw you nearer to Him, to submit to Him completely. And so, again, the most crucial question in life for every person is the one Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Well, in the book of Hebrews, a book there, that letter, it's going to help you to grow in your understanding of that question as we consider Jesus. Now, if you've never heard God speak, if, if you've, now again, I'm not saying audibly, but if you've never heard God speak to your heart as you're reading His Word, I recommend or I, I, I suggest try bowing down to Him. Do that and ask Him to reveal Himself to you through His Son as revealed in His written Word. God doesn't want to withhold His Son from you. He doesn't want to withhold His Word from you. He doesn't say, oh, you don't deserve it. No, He does. He wants to have that personal relationship with you. Jesus Christ died for each and every one of you. And wherever it is you're watching this, He died for you too. God sent a son for you. You're precious to him. You're important to him. All you have to do is receive him. That's all he's saying. Here, I have this gift for you. Will you accept it? Maybe you're watching this right now and you're... And you never thought of Jesus that way. Maybe you just always thought of him as a good teacher. Maybe you thought he was like, you know, just a prophet lived back in the day. Oh, there's more than that. He's Savior. He came to die for each and every one of you. He came to forgive you of your sins. He came to free you from the bonds, from the shackles of death, from the shackles of, of, of hell. And now, through him now, because of him, you can have freedom. You don't have to worry about your eternal security. If you receive him, if you accept him, if you believe in him, if you confess him, if you open your heart to him, he will come in and make things new. He may go in there and clean out a bunch of stuff that's in there, but... It's all good. And it will change your life forever. So if you're watching this, if you're here watching this or listening to this and you're ready to be born again, you're ready to become a child of God, I want to invite you to the cross where you can lay all your sins before Him and allow Him to forgive you. Every single one of your sins, no matter how bad it is, even if you murdered somebody, if you've committed adultery, whatever sin it is, no sin, no it is a great sin or a small sin, it's all sin to the Lord, and He will forgive you all of it, past, present, and future. If that's what you'd like to do. 
And I want to, again, I want to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So wherever you're at, you close your eyes and bow your head. If you're a believer, I ask you that you close your eyes and bow your head too and pray for those that are praying this prayer that the Holy Spirit will move powerfully. But for those of you who are ready to receive Jesus, pray this with all sincerity. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. So now I ask you to fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that he may help guide me so that he may teach me, so that he may help me draw near to God the Father, so that he may help me hear more clearly the words written in Scripture, and so that he may show me out how great he is. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me new life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, please reach out to us. You want to hear your story? You want to hear how... We want to hear how you came to watch this video and we would like to invite you here if you're locally, if you're around, we're in the corner of Hano Pass and Gateway South. Doors are open to, to you, to anybody, um, regardless of what your past life was or what you may have done, what you look like, where you've been, kind of lifestyle you've had. You know, we, our doors are open to you, we want to minister to you, continue to share God's word with you. If you're out of state or in a different, you know, different country, give us, give us a call or get a hold of us. We'll lead you, help you find a, a, a good Bible teaching church in your area. Um, you're definitely going to need that as a new believer. So that's going to conclude today's message. I want to, for those watching, again, if you need anything, please contact us at our church website. There's our, all our information, contact information is there. We thank you so much for, again, taking time out of your Sunday to watch this video. Um, pray that your life will continue to be blessed and changed by God. Thank you. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.